All right, we're going to continue our lecture on the skin, picking up with um, some of the structures we find in the dermis and in the epidermis. So we'll begin by talking about what gives the hair its color. When we look at different shades of hair, whether it be brown hair, um, blonde hair, black hair, that hair color is determined by the amount of melanin secretion from the melanocytes in the skin or in the iris of the eyes. So when we look at a person with dark skin color, they have more melanin production from their melanocytes. And the key concept here, it's not the number of melanocytes that determines how dark hair is, but it's the amount of melanin that those melanocytes produce. So if someone has purely white hair, we can say that those melanocytes do not produce any melanin. If someone has pink eyes, like if you look at a white rat or a white mouse, for example, that has pink eyes or a white rabbit, there is no melanin production in that iris, and what we're seeing are the blood vessels behind the iris that are giving the eyes that red color. So white means no melanin, and pink in the eyes means no melanin production there as well. So again, it's the amount of melanin, not the number of melanocytes that determines hair color. The muscles that we talked about that are attached to the hair follicle are called the erector pili muscle, and that's what gives us goosebumps. When they contract, they pull that hair upright, as you can see in the picture here. Normally, hair lays down against our skin, but when the erector pili muscle contracts, it pulls those hair upright, and we can see how the hair follicle uh, bulges. So that's why we call those goosebumps. And that can happen not only when we're cold, but when we have some kind of emotional response, like if you've been startled, if you're scared, sometimes just someone telling you a sad story or something that's particularly touching, it can cause that sensation of um, our hair feeling like it's standing up. And again, that's the result of the erector pili muscle. Different types of uh, glands are found in the dermis. The oil glands are associated with the hair follicle. You can see it's attached to the hair follicle. So as sebum, or oil, is produced, that oil rides up the hair to the surface of the skin and moisturizes the surface of, a, of the skin. So with good oil production, our skin is moist and supple and doesn't tear as easily. But as we age, our oil production goes down from our sebaceous glands and that causes dry, flaky skin at the surface and can increase the risk of injury because we don't have that um, moisturizing, waterproof layer. So as a result, if you look at a person who is you know, in their 80s and 90s, maybe a resident of a nursing home, um, we don't have to bathe them every day and it would be damaging to their skin to bathe them every day. Typically they are bathed once a week. Hair is washed once a week. <clears throat> Excuse me, but it's important to keep them clean in areas where there is bacteria. For example, the uh, anal area and the genital area, we always keep those areas clean by doing, doing daily perineal care on, on residents, sometimes even twice a day, once in the morning, once at night. So that's how we keep people clean without damaging or drying out their hair and skin. There's two different types of sweat glands we see in the skin. There's this one here, this the merocrine sweat gland. It's a little higher in the dermis, and that secretes its contents via a pore to the surface. And these are for body temperature control. So when we sweat, when it gets warm out, or if we've been exercising, that uh, activates those merocrine sweat glands to secrete their contents on the surface. And as that sweat evaporates out the surface, it takes heat with it. These other special sweat glands that are deeper in this, uh, below the skin in the hypodermis are the apocrine sweat glands, and these contribute to body odor because if we can see how they work, they secrete their sweat through the hair follicle and it rides up the hair follicle to the surface of the skin. And if there's bacteria on the surface of the skin, which there often is in the armpit region, in the anal region and in the genital region because these areas are typically dark and moist and you have skin on skin which creates moisture. So as a result of that, this, these secretions from these sweat glands can eventually produce body odor. So it's not the secretion that has the odor, but it's the secretion mixed with bacteria on the surface that causes the body odor. So that's why we typically wear deodorant as we enter puberty because these apocrine sweat glands become activated at that time. And as we age, just like the sebaceous glands, these sweat glands also decrease in their activity and therefore elderly typically don't get the um, armpit odor that younger people get. 
and um, in a in a negative way in the sense of the miracrin sweat glands these don't produce sweat as well either and on a hot day when most of us would be sweating and helping bring our body temperature down an elderly person is not going to sweat and that puts them more at risk for hyperthermia so it's really important we watch the elderly on a very hot day for example in Chicago where there's a lot of concrete a lot of tall high-rise buildings and the temperatures can get really high in the summertime if those buildings those apartments don't have air conditioning that is very uh, risky for elderly residents in those apartments because of their inability to sweat and control their body temperature so it's important for the for those individuals to get in the bathtub rest in some cool water use cool washcloths anything that can uh, create some moisture on the surface to, to take some of that heat away from the surface of the skin and, and cool them down when we look at the skin in terms of injury from burns we describe them as either partial thickness burns or full thickness burns partial thickness means part of the skin has been burned full thickness means the both layers of the skin have been burned so that would include the epidermis and the dermis have been burned when we have a full thickness burn so the two partial thickness burns the least serious is a first degree burn a first degree burn only involves the epidermis for example when a person gets a sunburn and their skin turns a reddish pink and it's a little bit painful but it doesn't blister that's an example of a first degree burn and within a couple days that'll usually resolve and the skin goes back to its normal color maybe some uh, peeling will occur but typically not much damage and it quickly it heals so that's the first degree burn second degree burn involves the dermis as well as the epidermis so these burns are characterized by being painful because you're affecting the nerve endings and also they blister because we're losing that entire epidermis and that peels away exposing uh, the dermis underneath so this will take a while to heal a little bit longer not terribly long but longer than a first degree burn would and an example of a second typical second degree burn would be if you're pulling a hot pan out of the oven and it touches your finger so you have a hole in the hot pad and you get a blister that's a uh, characteristic of a second degree burn one of the best things you can do in a nursing home where people might spill coffee on their lap spill hot soup on their lap um, is to cool the skin down as quickly as possible so it doesn't continue the burn going deeper into the skin so people might think you're a little crazy but if someone spilled hot coffee on their lap or a resident spilled some hot soup on their lap the best thing you could do would be to run over there grab their water pitcher or their glass of milk and dump that on their lap as well that'll cool that down quickly and prevent that burn from spreading or going any deeper so they like I said they might look at you a little funny but you're actually preventing them from further injury a third degree burn like we said is a full thickness burn which means we have burned both the epidermis and the dermis and we're looking at underlying layers such as fat muscle or bone these um, types of burns do not heal on their own they require skin grafts using a patient's own skin which is split skin artificial skin or cadavers so from deceased individuals or using pig skin but it's always best to use the patient's own skin because there's less chance for rejection that way so typically they'll go to the thigh the back or the buttocks to get that skin and um, replace it but over time those grafts uh, eventually will break down and become less elastic and then they have to be removed and new grafts put down so for people that have had extensive burns over their face for example that's going to require several different grafts and removing the graft putting new ones on it's quite a lifelong process for those individuals so the um, third degree burns again are characterized by epidermis and dermis have been completely burned through looking at underlying tissues such as fat muscle or bone and these burns are not painful that's an important thing to remember third degree burns are not painful because all the nerve endings in the dermis have been burned away and they're no longer functioning so that can be dangerous people can be severely burned and not really know how bad their condition is when a patient would arrive or be first assessed by a health care worker they might apply the rule of nines to determine what percent of the body has been burned because we use this information to determine how we're going to intervene and help these patients so you'll notice that if we divide the surface area of the body up into different 
sections, they're factors of 9, so either 9, 1, or 18, which makes it a little easier to remember. It's a little different in a child because their head is bigger compared to their body than in an adult, but for the adult body, it's factors of 9. So the head would be 9%, each upper arm would be 9%. The trunk, front or back, each is 18%, the genitals 1%, and each lower leg would be 18%. So if someone burned uh, their arm, say they fell into a fire and they burned both arms up to the arm per armpit, we would say they burned 18% of their body surface. So as we age, we find some changes in the skin. First of all, the protein fibers that we find in the um, dermis, and hypo, hypodermis break down. As a result, the skin becomes less elastic. It sags. It wrinkles. We lose fat in the hypodermis. That also contributes to wrinkling. It also contributes to a lack of insulation. And again, that's why the elderly might crank up the heat in their home up to 80 degrees and also have a sweater, long sleeve shirt on because of that loss of insulating layer in the hypodermis. Sebaceous and sweat gland activity goes down, like we said, making the skin drier. We can't control temperature as well. We need uh, to be bathed less as a result of less sweat gland activity. And melanin production also goes down. You'll notice that uh, people, as they age, their hair starts to turn white. Their skin is more white. And we sometimes see abnormal activity of melanocytes causing age spots or new moles to appear on the body surface. Some disorders of the skin that are common that we see out in the community. Um, acne is very common. Uh, bacterial, that's a small localized bacterial infection in the skin, uh, particularly under the influence of hormones. So people find anywhere from the ages of 12 through 26, people struggle with acne. So there's lots of different medicines out there that can control that, sometimes even uh, you know, topical medications, some are even oral medications that people take that helps control acne. Uh, people find when, uh, women find when they're on birth control, they have less trouble with acne because those birth control pills also control hormone secretion, so they don't have those hormone swings seen with the typical menstrual cycle, so that helps to control acne as well. <clears throat> Some viruses that infect the skin, chickenpox, German measles, and cold sores are three common examples. Those viruses enter through a break in the skin and they live in the nerve ending in the dermis. So they reside there for life and when the immunity goes down, for example, for a patient that's undergoing chemotherapy, they might have an outbreak um, of a cold sore or chickenpox in adults is typically exhibits itself as shingles. Um, so if the body is stressed, we can see these viral infections come back and cause blistering on the surface. So cold sores are probably the most common, um, also known as herpes simplex 1 or oral herpes. This is highly contagious among people that are in contact with these sores, for example, kissing, sharing, uh, eating utensils, sharing drinks through a straw or just the edge of a glass. So it's really important if a person has a cold sore or knows some, someone with a cold sore that they don't uh, come in contact with other people if they want to limit that transmission of that infection. Um, it's pretty much everywhere, so people have gotten these from a drinking fountain at school. Um, chewing on the end of a pencil or of a classmate. So it's very, very common to get cold sores. And um, once a person has a cold sore, they'll always have a cold sore. So again, um, it's important to control that infection by not spreading the virus, especially when there's an open sore on the lip. Bed sores or decubitus ulcers are the result of the skin not getting enough oxygen. So when a person sits too long and their bony skeleton is pressing on the skin and they don't shift their weight, those cells become starved of oxygen, which we call ischemia, and they can die. Necrosis is cell death. And if that skin dies, um, it may be able to be replaced by surrounding skin, but if it gets large enough and deep enough, sometimes these bed sores get out of control and can lead to infection and death, especially in long-term health care facilities where you have people that are immunocompromised and don't have the ability to shift their weight or move around, say advanced Alzheimer's or near the end of life in comas. Um, that's put those, those scenarios put people at increased risk for bed sores and infection and death. As we die, however, in the nursing home, sometimes you'll, if you have 
um, had an experience with nursing home residents. The dying process does uh, shift or um, shunt blood from the skin to the internal organs. So toward the end of life, bed sores may develop even with the best of care. So it's important not to judge when you see a patient come in with a bed sore that's in the dying process because that's just part of the natural dying process where the blood flow to the skin is impaired and that increases the risk for um, bed sores. Three different types of cancers affect the skin. These are these are skin cancers. All are a result of um, can be a result of exposure to sunlight. Particularly the the first two. We see the first two types of skin cancer common among people who are out in the sun a lot, like farmers and construction workers, or people that just love to sunbathe because they like to have nice dark skin. Um, usually it's in the 40s and 50s and beyond where we start to see these um, skin cancers develop. And the good news is if they're detected, um, they can be treated early and they don't metastasize as quickly. Of the two, the basal cell carcinoma is the least likely to metastasize and it's highly treatable. Squamous cell carcinoma is also easily treatable, but it's a little more likely to metastasize or spread to the rest of the body. So that one's a little more dangerous than the basal cell. And the malignant melanoma is the is a special skin cancer that strikes both the young and the old. So it's not only among people in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, but it can be later, uh, I'm sorry, earlier in life. And those at risk for melanoma would be individuals that have red hair and freckles, like we can see in this picture here. Here's an abnormal mole. We can see some freckles in the background, so that is characteristic of malignant melanoma, where those melanocytes are uh, dividing out of control and contributing to cancer. So this spreads very quickly to other parts of the body and can cause death among young people. So people with red hair and freckles should really avoid the sun and not expose that in you know, those moles or their skin to um, extra UV radiation. Your textbook in chapter 4, particularly page 127, talks about malignant melanoma and mentions the ABCD rule for assessing moles to see if they're changing and if they need to be seen or evaluated by a doctor. Definitely a very serious cancer. And in my clinical experience in the hospital, I've heard of several individuals, young people, in their 30s and younger that have had an abnormal mole and they passed away from this type of cancer within months of diagnosis. So very, very important to watch a mole and to have it be looked at if it looks unusual. And again, you can use that ABCD description on page 127 to see if you have a mole or someone you know has a mole that should be evaluated. So that concludes our discussion of the skin. If you look at your syllabus, you'll see we are on track with our discussion in terms of skin and tissues for this week. And next week is your lecture exam that you'll have to take by the end of the week. So that would be by February 8th. You need to take lecture exam number two covering the cell, tissues, and skin. Make sure you do the practice lab exam so you feel comfortable for the lab exam. Um, the week after that, but get on the Mastering AMP website. Be sure to do the lecture homework for the tissues, cell, and skin. That'll really help you reinforce and get ready for that lecture exam next week. So that's going to be a computerized exam at your proctored site. It'll be under the lockdown browser, and you have to take that Friday, February 8th by 5 p.m. So whenever you feel ready, make sure that you let me know especially if you're not going to test at the assessment center in La Crosse here. If you're going to another site, let me know so I can make sure I get that password to those proctored sites and they have the information they need to set you up for the test. Have a great weekend and we'll talk again.